Hello everyone and welcome to another Lancaster Safety Webinar Wednesday. This time of year is when we get the most record-keeping questions from our clients, and that's exactly what LSCI is here for. We're happy to assist you in the sometimes confusing process of record-keeping and reporting. Today's webinar will cover the basics and give you a really good foundation of knowledge for record-keeping. We'll go into the step-by-step -step process and give you tools and resources to use so that you can soon be a record-keeping master. And I'm here today with one of our record-keeping masters. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. Emily, thank you so much for having me here today. As the LSEI record-keeping team lead, I manage our OSHA 300 logs, track injuries and trends, and work with our safety committee to discuss corrective action to mitigate work-related injuries and incidents. Now let's get started. Today, we're gonna to discuss record keeping basics and provide an overview of the standard, review how to properly maintain OSHA injury and illness logs, and provide an overview of OSHA's reporting requirements. The records are also used by employers and employees to manage safety and health programs at individual workplaces. This information helps employers, workers, and OSHA evaluate the safety of the workplace, understand industry hazards, and implement worker protections to reduce and eliminate hazards, which will then prevent future workplace injuries and illnesses. The recording of an injury or illness neither affects a person's entitlement to workers' compensation, nor proves a violation of an OSHA rule. All right, so just a quick disclaimer before we get started. Today's presentation will cover a lot of information with respect to OSHA's regulations, as well as non-required practices and recommendations. So we'd like to take the time to just remind you that the information we're reviewing should be used as a tool to improving workplace safety and health and does not create any additional legal obligations, nor does it review all obligations outlined in statutes, regulations, and standards. So Sarah, let me um, start off with a question here. Does record keeping apply to everyone? Well, Emily, no, but it does apply to most, including those in agriculture, construction, manufacturing, transportation, utilities, and wholesale trade sectors are covered. However, OSHA does have a partial size exemption for record keeping. If your company had 10 or fewer employees at all times during the last calendar year, you do not need to keep injury and illness records unless surveyed by OSHA or BLS. The size exemption is based on the number of employees in the entire company, including temporary employees who you supervise on a day-to-day -day basis in the count. The size exemption is based on the company's peak employment during the last calendar year. If at any time last year, the company reached 11 or more workers, the company is not size exempt. All right, so we covered the exemptions. Now, if a company is not exempt, then what do they have to do? Well, Emily, covered employers must record each fatality or injury or illness that is work-related, is considered a new case, and meets OSHA's general recording criteria, such as having an incident involving fatalities, days away from work, job transfer restriction, or other recordable injuries, such as receiving medical treatment. Don't worry, we will be discussing OSHA's general recording criteria for you here today. All right, so now let's move on to the all important record keeping forms. Now the rule requires employers to keep three forms, a 300 log, a 300A summary form, and then a 301 incident report. The OSHA 300 log is an outline of all work related injuries and illnesses for the given year. It includes injury classifications and the amount of time that the employee may have been away from work or on job restriction. The OSHA 300A is a summary of the OSHA 300 log from that calendar year. It's required to be posted for three months. Lastly, the OSHA 301 form is the injury and illness incident report. So this report will provide details about each recordable incident. Now, if your company currently maintains their own injury and illness incident report, you can continue to use it just as long as it has the equivalent information as OSHA's form 301. Now, here are a few guidelines for you when completing and maintaining the record keeping forms. First, employers must enter each recordable case on the forms within seven calendar days of receiving information that a recordable case occurred. Next, forms can be kept on a computer as long as they are produced when they are needed. You must keep a separate log and summary for each physical location that is expected to be in operation for one year or longer. 
Keep in mind that a case on the log does not mean that the employer or worker was at fault or that an OSHA standard was violated. If a government representative such as OSHA or NIOSH requests for a copy of the forms, you must provide copies of the records within four business hours. Make sure to use the business hours of the establishment where the records are located. For example, if an inspection is in Texas and the records are in New York, use the business hours of New York. Okay, so here is an example of OSHA's Form 300. Column A includes the case number in order they have occurred throughout the year. Column B includes the employee's name. If it's a private recordable case, you can just leave the name off. Column C and D include the injured employee's job title and the date of the injury. Column E includes the location where the incident occurred. Be more specific than a wide area, for example, so packaging department rather than just warehouse. Column F includes a description of the recordable incident. Describe the injury or illness in its entirety, including the nature of the injury or illness, the affected body part, and what exactly caused it. The next column asks you to check one box, G through J, indicating the most severe result of the injury or illness, death, days away from work, job transfer or restriction, or other recordable cases. Now, when recording cases that have both days away from work and restriction, you're only to check it as days away from work when classifying the case since that's the most serious outcome. Column K and L are for recording the days away from work and how many days the employee ended up spending on restriction or job transfer. The final column is where you check the nature of the injury or illness from six options. Injury, skin disorder, respiratory condition, poisoning, hearing loss, or other. Let's take a look at the annual summary. The employer must first review the records and correct them if necessary, then complete the form, certify the form, and post it for three months. A company executive must certify the summary. This could be an owner of the company, an officer of the corporation, the highest ranking company official working at the establishment, or his or her supervisor. Be sure to post the summary from February 1st to April 30th in an area where employees can easily review it. Please make sure that you only post the OSHA 300A summary. Do not post forms 300 or 301 as they may contain personal information. So now that we've reviewed the information that has to be recorded, what about private information that other employees shouldn't know about? Can employees expect any privacy in the record keeping process? For certain privacy concern cases, employers must not enter the employee's name on the 300 form. Instead, they are to enter a privacy case. A separate confidential list of employees' names and case numbers must be kept by the employer and provided to an OSHA inspector upon request. Privacy concern cases are an injury or illness to an intimate body part or the reproductive system, an injury or illness resulting from sexual assault, mental illness, HIV infection, hepatitis or tuberculosis, needle stick and sharps injuries that are contaminated with another person's blood or potentially infectious material, or illness cases where employees independently and voluntarily request that their names not to be entered on the law. For a privacy concern case, if the employee's identity can still be implied, the employer may use some discretion in describing the case. The rule requires that enough information be entered to identify the cause and general severity of the incident. For example, a sexual assault can be entered as assault or an injury to the reproductive organ can be entered as a lower abdominal injury. The employer is not required to go into graphic detail in these types of cases. If the employer gives out forms to the public, the names must be removed first. There are exceptions for employee access, OSHA access, auditors, insurance, or law enforcement personnel. So how long do we need to keep these records? Just five years. This will help keep those filing cabinets from overflowing. Now, during that retention period, the employer must update the 300 form to include any cases that are newly discovered or whose status has changed, but does not have to change the summary or the 301 form. If the outcome or extent of an injury or illness changes after you've recorded the case, simply draw a line through the original entry, or if you wish, delete or white out the original entry. Then write the new entry where it belongs. Now remember, you need to record the most serious outcome for each case. OSHA also requires a number of employers to electronically submit a summary of injuries and illnesses to OSHA. 
Once you've completed your forms, you might be required to send them into OSHA electronically. Establishments with 250 or more employees that are currently required to keep OSHA injury and illness records and establishments with 20 to 249 employees that are classified in certain industries with historically high rates of occupational injuries and illnesses are required. A few examples of the certain industries who are required to submit their OSHA record keeping information include construction, manufacturing, warehousing, storage, and waste treatment and disposal. While these are just a few of the industries who are covered, OSHA has a dedicated webpage that goes over what establishments are and who are not required to submit the forms. If you're unsure if you need to or not, give us a call at 888-403-6026 or email us at safetyquestions at lancastersafety.com. For those establishments who are required to submit the record keeping information, OSHA provides a secure website that offers three options for data submission. One, use OSHA's secure website and submit data through the form submission. Two, you can upload a CSV file to process one or multiple establishments at the same time. Three, some companies may use an automated record keeping system that will have the ability to transmit data via an application programming interface. Keep in mind that OSHA approved state plans and state and local government establishments may have different submission requirements. Remember the deadline to submit the information to OSHA is March 2nd of each year. They also start accepting form submissions in January. So should employees be involved in the record keeping process? Well, Emily, the rule requires each employer to set up a way for employees to report injuries and illnesses, and they must be properly informed on how to do so. This is a very basic step to make sure employees report cases so that they can get on their records. You can get your employees involved by discussing the recordable injuries each year, identify common injuries, causes, and reasonings to develop procedures to mitigate those hazards and prevent them from a recordable injury or illness from occurring again. At LSCI, we discuss all near misses and first aid incidents monthly at our safety committee meeting. It provides an opportunity for the committee to review any potential contributing factors to the incident, discuss trends that we may be seeing, and also determine if any additional engineering, administrative, or PPE control should be implemented at this time. Now let's talk about Section 11C of the Act. Employers are required to inform workers of their right to report work-related injuries and illnesses without the fear of retaliation. Please understand that the rule does not ban appropriate disciplinary, incentive, or drug testing programs. However, it does allow OSHA to issue citations for retaliatory actions against workers when these programs are used to discourage workers from exercising their right to report workplace injury and illnesses. To clarify, an employer will be in violation of OSHA's new final rule if the company either fails to have a procedure for employees to report work-related injuries or illnesses or its reporting procedure is unreasonable. You must not discharge or in any manner discriminate against any employee for reporting a work-related injury or illness. When it comes to incentive programs, they can be used to promote workplace safety and health. However, the incentive program should not be implemented in a manner that discourages reporting. Emily, could you give us an example of how an incentive program could discourage reporting? Also, are employers are permitted to drug test employees after an incident? So that's a good question, and OSHA gives us the following examples. If an employer raffles off a $500 gift card at the end of each month in which there are no workplace injuries, this incentive program would violate the anti-retaliation provision as it withholds the incentive, in this case, the $500 gift card, when an employee reports a work-related injury. Now, on the other hand, an acceptable alternative would be for the employer to raffle off a gift card each month in which employees universally comply with legitimate safety rules, such as using required fall protection and following lockout tagout rules. Now, the key here is whether the employer is withholding a benefit because of a reported work-related injury. Incentive programs that penalize the reporting of injuries and illnesses are likely to result in an OSHA citation. Now for your other question, when it comes to drug testing policies, OSHA states that they will consider factors including whether the employer has a reasonable basis for concluding that drug use could have contributed to the injury or illness. 
OSHA is looking whether an employer is using drug and or alcohol testing as a form of discipline against employees who report a workplace injury, which then would be retaliation. Now, consequently, post-accident drug testing is permitted if all workers involved in the accident are tested in order to gain insight into the cause of the accident. But drug testing an employee whose injury could not possibly be related to drug use, such as a repetitive strain injury, would then be seen as retaliation. Thank you, Emily. Therefore, it is important to know that OSHA prohibits employers from taking adverse action against employees for reporting work-related injuries or illnesses. To clarify, adverse action is action taken by the employer that would discourage a reasonable employee from reporting a work-related illness or injury accurately. All right, so let's take a break for a quick Insta Safety quiz. When must employers post their 300A forms from the previous year? Now, this is an important question, so if you're not sure of the answer, make sure to write it down. Is it A, January 1st through March 31st? B, June 1st through December 31st? C, February 1st through April 30th? Or D, year round? You can put your answers below in the chat box. All right, so the answer is C, February 1st through April 30th. Employers must post their OSHA 300A injury and illness log from the previous year in an area that all employees may view. So that could be a lunchroom or maybe a break room, and that's from February 1st through April 30th annually. So it can be very confusing trying to figure out if temporary workers, subs, and employees at different locations are covered for record keeping. So Sarah, can you just go into some of the guidelines that we need to follow here? Sure, Emily, I'd be glad to. Employees on the payroll must be included in the employer's records unless the company is acting as a temporary help service. Temporary workers will be the employees of the party exercising day-to-day -day control over them, and the supervising party will be the one to record the injuries and illnesses. We often receive questions from companies who have had temporary employees or subcontractors get injured on the job. Typically in construction, they are unsure if the subcontractor or the general contractor should be recording this injury. What it comes down to is the company who's in charge of the day-to-day -day supervision of the employee is required to record that OSHA recordable injury. This way, we can make sure that the case is recorded appropriately on the applicable OSHA 300 log. That's good information, Sarah. And I just want to add real quick, too, if you're in this situation and it seems really confusing and you're not sure, you know, what to record and what not to record, just give us a call. And this is exactly what we're here to help you with. When the employer has more than one establishment, a separate log must be kept for each establishment expected to be in operation for more than one year. OSHA defines an establishment as a single physical location where business is conducted or where services or industrial operations are performed. If your company has a continuous presence at a client site or job site for one year or longer, you must treat it as an establishment and maintain an OSHA 300 log. For short-term establishments, which are those expected to be in operation for less than one year, the employer may keep one log that includes all injuries and illnesses at the short-term establishments or keep logs by the state or district. So here's another slide that we suggest taking some notes on. When do employers need to report an accident to OSHA? All employers under OSHA jurisdiction must report these incidents to OSHA, even employers who are exempt from maintaining OSHA record keeping forms due to company size or industry. OSHA requires you to report all work-related fatalities within eight hours and those fatalities that occur within 30 days of a work-related incident, and all incidents involving an inpatient hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye must be reported to OSHA within 24 hours. You can report to OSHA by calling OSHA's free confidential number, calling your closest OSHA area office during normal business hours, or using their new online form. Be prepared to supply the business name, names of the employees affected, location and time of the incident, a brief description of the incident, and contact person and phone number. Okay, Sarah, so you're saying that even if I am exempt from record keeping, I am not exempt from reporting these things to OSHA, correct? Correct, Emily. All employers under OSHA jurisdiction, whether they are required to maintain record keeping forms or not, are required to follow these reporting requirements. Okay, good to know. So now when do we need to record an injury? So Emily, when we're looking specifically at general recording criteria, if your company experiences one or more of the following, you'll need to record it. 
death, days away from work, restricted work activity, transfer to another job, medical treatment beyond first aid, loss of consciousness, or a significant injury or illness diagnosed by a physician or licensed healthcare professional. Don't worry, we will go into detail a little later on how OSHA defines the differences between medical treatment and first aid. For now, it is also important to know that all work-related cases involving loss of consciousness must be recorded. All right, so here's another question for you. What defines work-relatedness when it comes to recordable incidents? Work-relatedness is presumed for injuries and illnesses resulting from events or exposures occurring in the work environment unless a specific exception applies. OSHA defines the work environment as the establishment and other locations where one or more employees are working or are present as a condition of their employment. The work environment includes not only their physical location, but also the equipment or materials used by the employee during the course of his or her work. The case is presumed work-related if and only if an event or exposure in the work environment is a discernible cause of the injury or illness or of a significant aggravation to a pre-existing condition. Now let me cover the exemptions because there are quite a few. Work-related exposures include most of the employee's activities on the employer's premises as well as situations off-premises where employees are engaged in job tasks or as a condition of employment. Here are a few examples of incidents that would not need to be recorded. If an employee catches a cold or flu, gets injured in a voluntary wellness program, or is injured in a motor vehicle accident while on their lunch break. Please note that for record keeping purposes, company parking lots are considered part of the employer's premises and therefore part of the establishment. For example, let's say an employee arrives for work as she is walking across the parking lot prior to the start of her shift, she is stung by a bee and then has an allergic reaction. She is taken to the doctor where she is given an injection and a prescription. Would this case be recordable? The answer is yes, this case is recordable. The parking lot is considered part of the establishment and thus the work environment. Punching in and out of the time clock does not determine work-relatedness. The bee sting is considered a work-related injury and the employee was administered a prescription, which is considered medical treatment. Now let's discuss another tricky scenario. An employee is participating in a lineman's rodeo sponsored by the employer on the employer's property, but not on company time. The worker falls and injures his back and breaks his leg. He's off work for weeks. Would this be an OSHA recordable injury? In this case, you are not required to record an injury or illness if the injury or illness results solely from voluntary participation in a recreational activity. However, if the employee was at the rodeo as condition of employment, the case would then be related and be recordable. More exemptions include any employee symptoms that come about solely due to a non-work-related incident. An example of this exception could be an if an employee starts vomiting at work due to something that they ate the night before. More and more businesses have employees traveling for work or who are working from home. And we're often asked about what the criteria is for the remote workplace because this can be pretty confusing when it comes to recording injuries and illnesses. So Sarah, what do employers need to know in this type of setup? You're correct, Emily. We have received this type of question often due to more and more companies having employees working from home. When employees are at the establishment, they are in their work environment. When employees are working away from the establishment, they carry that bubble of work environment wherever they go. Okay, so now here's a little bit of a tricky question for you. Let's say an employee is injured on a work trip while they were out sightseeing. Would this be recordable? In this case, no. This would not be considered a work-related case because the employee was not performing any job-related tasks when the incident occurred. Okay, so just to reiterate, if you have employees working from home, that home is considered part of the working environment. Therefore, any injuries or illnesses that occur while an employee is working are considered work-related. Yes, that's correct. Injuries and illnesses that occur while an employee is working at a home office will be considered work-related if the injury or illness occurs while the employee is performing for work or compensation in the home and the injury or illness is directly related to the performance of work rather than the general home environment or setting. All right, so let's discuss another tricky scenario example. A salesman who works out of his private home slips and falls on ice in his driveway. 
The employee states he was carrying company property at the time of his fall. Would this be considered work-related? Well, Emily, that is a tricky scenario, but the answer is no. Ice outside the home is part of the general home setting, and injuries and illnesses are only recordable if it's directly related to the performance of work. So Sarah, when do we want to consider an injury or illness a new case? This can be really confusing when there are extenuating circumstances, am I right? Yes, for sure. You'll want to consider an injury or illness as a new case if the employee has not previously experienced a recorded injury or illness of the same type to the same part of the body. If there is a medical opinion regarding resolution of the case, the employer must follow that opinion. If two or more licensed healthcare professionals make conflicting recommendations, the employer is then required to base the decision on the best documented and most reasoned evidence. If an exposure triggers the reoccurrence, it is then a new case. This is generally the case in asthma or occupational dermatitis cases. If signs and symptoms reoccur even in the absence of exposure, it is not a new case. This is common for cases involving silicosis or tuberculosis. All right, now here's another noteworthy slide for you all. Cases that result in days away from work are recordable. The employer is to check the box for days away cases and count the number of days that the employee is away from work. The day of the injury or illness is not counted as a day away. While we know that cases that result in days away from work are recordable, it is important to note that the day of the injury or illness is not counted. You begin counting days away on the day after the injury occurred or illness began. You may cap the total days away at 180 calendar days. To clarify, you are not required to keep track of the number of calendar days away from work if the injury or illness resulted in more than 180 calendar days away from work or restriction. In such a case, entering 100 in the total days away field would be considered adequate. Also, it is important to note that an employee is considered to be a restricted work activity if he or she is unable to work a full shift or is unable to perform all work activities, he or she would be expected to do so at least once during a week. Here's an example. An employee has a work-related injury and is examined by a physician. The employee was released to return to work full duty with a 30-pound lifting restriction. This employee works in an office setting and is not expected to lift more than 30 pounds during a normal work week. Employees' routine job functions are those activities the employee would normally perform at least once per week. In this scenario, this employee is restricted from activities that he or she may have only performed only once or twice a month, and therefore it does not meet the definition of a routine job function. So now how does someone calculate the days to report? Emily, for days away or days restricted, you wanna always count the calendar days. Under this system, a special case arises when an employee is injured on a Friday night or right before a vacation and returns on the next scheduled day. If a licensed healthcare professional gives information that the employee should have not worked during those days off, then those days must be counted. The employer may stop counting days when they reach that 180 days away from work, or restricted or both, because then we know that this was a serious case. The employer may also stop counting days if the employee leaves the company for some reason not related to that injury or illness. For example, this could be a plant shutdown or retirement. If the employee is away from work for an extended time, the employer must record the case within seven days with an estimate of the days away and then update that day count when the actual number of days away or restricted becomes known. All right, so let's take another break for an Insta Safety quiz. An employee sustains a recordable injury that required six days away from work. However, the employee was already scheduled to take one vacation day the Monday after the injury occurred. How many days need to be recorded on the company's OSHA 300 log? Would it be A, seven days, which would be the day of the incident plus six days away to recover, B, six days, which is simply six required days, C, four days, the four days after the Monday of the following week, or D, five days, six required days minus one Monday vacation day. And we know this one's really tricky, so take a second and see what your answer is. The answer is actually B, six required days. 
He must count the number of calendar days the employee was unable to work as a result of the injury or illness, regardless of whether or not the employee was scheduled to work on those days. Weekend days, holidays, vacation days, or other days off are included in the total number of days recorded if the employee would not have been able to work on those days because of the work-related injury or illness. Let's talk about medical treatment. If a work-related injury or illness results in medical treatment beyond first aid, you must record this on your OSHA 300 log. OSHA states that medical treatment does not include visits to a physician solely for observation and counseling, including follow-up visits. Medical treatment also does not include diagnostic procedures such as x-rays, blood tests, or MRIs. Use of prescription medication for diagnostic purposes is also not considered medical treatment. For example, prescription eye drops used to dilate the pupils. Finally, medical treatment does not include first aid procedures. We will review what OSHA considers to be first aid treatment on the next few slides. So is first aid treatment different than medical treatment? Yes, OSHA defines first aid by using a list of procedures that are all inclusive. Therefore, if a procedure is not on this list, it is not considered first aid for record keeping purposes. The first item in the list is using non-prescription medication at non-prescription strength. This means that if an employee is provided prescription medications or non-prescription medications at prescription strength, it is therefore considered medical treatment. The rule also makes it clear that wound coverings, butterfly bandages, and stair strips are first aid. However, use of wound closure methods such as sutures, medical glues, or staples is considered medical treatment. The rule also makes it clear that hot or cold therapy is first aid regardless of how many times it is used. Here are the remaining list of procedures defined by OSHA as first aid treatment. If the employee only receives first aid treatment, it is not recordable. While removing foreign bodies from the eye using irrigation or a cotton swab is first aid, using other methods to remove materials from the eye would be then considered medical treatment. Physical therapy or chiropractic treatment is considered medical treatment and should not be confused with massage therapy for first aid. Also, drinking fluids for relief of heat stress would be considered first aid, but administering fluids through an IV is considered medical treatment. All right, so another Insta Safety Quiz question for you here. An employee was rushed to the urgent care center when he had a small flake of metal embedded in his eye while working. The urgent care center removed the metal flake with metal tweezers. The healthcare provider then gave the employee eye drops. Would this be recordable? A, no, they did not require stitches. B, yes, the doctor removed the flake by means other than flushing. C, no, the medical professional did not prescribe any medication. Or D, yes, the doctor gave the employee eye drops. So this one was a little bit tricky, but the answer is B. Yes, the doctor removed the flake by means other than flushing. While removing foreign bodies from the eye using irrigation or cotton swab is considered first aid, using other methods to remove materials from the eye would then be considered medical treatment. In this scenario, the urgent center has used tweezers to remove the metal flake and is therefore considered a recordable incident. Now that we've looked at the basics of recordable incidents, how to document an injury, and what defines medical treatment, let's take a look at some specific types of injuries that you may run into in the workplace. OSHA believes that the most significant injuries and illnesses will result in one of the criteria listed in the record keeping standard, such as death, days away from work, restricted work or job transfer, medical treatment beyond first aid, or loss of consciousness. However, there are some significant injuries, such as a punctured eardrum or a fractured toe or rib, for which neither medical treatment nor work restrictions may be recommended. In addition, there are some significant progressive diseases, such as silicosis and some types of cancer, for which medical treatment or work restrictions may not be recommended at the time of diagnosis, but are likely to be recommended as the disease progresses. Now, OSHA believes that cancer, chronic irreversible diseases, fractured or cracked bones, and punctured eardrums are generally considered significant injuries and illnesses, and then must be recorded at the initial diagnosis, even if medical treatment or work restrictions are not recommended or are postponed in a particular case. This next provision has the greatest effect on the healthcare sector, especially hospitals and nursing homes. The rule requires the recording of all work-related needle sticks and cuts from contaminated sharp objects. If you're required to maintain a log of occupational injuries and illnesses under the record-keeping standard, 
You must also establish and maintain a sharps injury log for recording injuries from contaminated sharps. The sharps log must contain, at a minimum, information about the injury, the type and brand of device involved in the injury, if known, the department or work area where the exposure occurred, and an explanation of how the incident occurred. The 300 log must be recorded and maintained in such a manner to protect the confidentiality of the injured employee and listed as a privacy case. Medical removal incidents are when the employer records a case of an employee being removed from work based on the standard criteria. Several OSHA standards have specific criteria outlining when that may be necessary to do so, this including lead, cadmium, and benzene standards. Now, the case is recorded as a days away or restricted work case, depending on how the employer deals with the removal. If employers voluntarily remove employees when they experience levels below the thresholds outlined in the standard, the case does not need to be recorded under this paragraph. While most of our record keeping questions we receive are primarily focused on injuries, it is important to take a look at when a hearing loss case is considered an OSHA recordable. Hearing loss is no joke. It can happen suddenly or over time and get progressively worse. In the workplace, employers must record work-related hearing loss cases when an employee's hearing test shows a marked decrease in overall hearing. Here is when you need to record a hearing loss case on your OSHA 300 log. A recordable hearing loss case occurs when an employee experiences a standard threshold shift, that standard threshold shift is considered work-related, and the employee's hearing loss exceeds 25 decibels from the audiometric zero in the same year as that standard threshold shift. For hearing loss cases, you want to make sure that you check hearing loss under column M on your OSHA 300 log. If a physician or other licensed healthcare professional determines that the hearing loss is not work-related or has not been significantly aggravated by occupational noise exposure, employers are not required to record that case. So we're coming to the end of our webinar today and we want to wrap up the key points that we really want to leave you with today. In summary, record keeping is required for most businesses and it is a good way to evaluate your workplace's injuries and illnesses in order to help prevent future incidents from occurring. Covered employers must record each fatality, injury, or illness that is work-related and is considered a new case. Make sure you complete the OSHA 300 log accurately. You don't want to leave out any specific detail. Have one of our consultants review it and ask us for assistance with any questions by calling 888-403-6026 or email us at safetyquestions at lancastersafety.com. Make sure to post the OSHA 300A form from February 1st to April 30th every year. If you experience an employee who has a terrible work-related accident, such as a loss of an eye, amputation, or inpatient hospitalization, you must report this incident within 24 hours. If you tragically experience an employee who dies because of a work-related accident, you must report to OSHA within eight hours. And this slide shows the criteria for reporting a serious injury. You can report to OSHA by calling OSHA's free confidential number or by calling your local area OSHA office during normal business hours or by using the online form at OSHA.gov. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen in today. As you may know, we're a nationwide OSHA consulting firm that offers safety and health training on site or through a learning management system. We help with OSHA inspections, audits, develop written programs, and so much more. Feel free to reach out to us after the webinar for any questions. Also, follow us on social media for more news updates and safety information, or you can provide us with feedback on either Yelp, Google, or Facebook. Again, we really appreciate your time and hope that you'll take advantage of our monthly safety and health webinars. Everyone is always invited to attend and they're always free. Just visit our website for more information. So Sarah, thank you so much for being here with me today. That was a lot of information. Um, I hope it really helps our, our clients and listeners. And um, again, just wanna reiterate that we're always here to help um, with those record keeping um, questions. Thank you so much, Emily, for having me. I always enjoy an opportunity to discuss OSHA's record keeping requirements. Remember, if you maintain your record keeping forms accurately and involve both employees and management on tracking trends of those work related incidents, you can develop proper mitigation methods to prevent future incidents and illnesses. Thank you everyone and have a safe day.